Hey everyone, how you doing out there? Welcome to the first episode of a new series I'm starting titled Inside Track. So every Friday at four o'clock for the next couple of months, I'll be picking a topic, music topic, and doing a one hour or so tutorial on it. If you're catching this at a later date, there'll be timestamps in both the description box below and also in a pinned comment with chapters so you can navigate past things that you might not find too interesting, but hopefully I can keep you engaged for the next hour. So uh, today I thought I'd take a look at a technique used in film scoring. So to start off, I'm working right now on a project which I can't talk too specifically about, but it's a three episode mini series and it's a uh, a documentary series and it's historical it's about something that actually happened and it, it's set in the late 1990s or ma mainly from the mid early 70s through the mid 1990s and there's a story to be told so typically when I start a film scoring project there is no set way with which to create the score sometimes I get a film and I start right from the film writing music. Sometimes I get a film that has temporary or placement placeholder music that I have to use as a rough guide. Sometimes uh, I create a library of music that is placed in the film and then I have to go back and rescore the film. There's, there's no real set way to do it and that's one of the beauties of film scoring is that the solution to every score is project dependent, meaning that every project you're working on requires a unique approach to realizing the score. So now with that being said, there are technical things that I do every time in order to make composing easier in terms of setting up my DAW, which in my case is Pro Tools, uh, how I label my tracks, how I order tracks, how I route things, the kinds of effect sends I do, and just my general technique of sequencing, that's pretty uniform. But the actual kind of music, the sounds I use, the style of music, the techniques for performance and recording and capturing sounds, those are dependent upon the style of music that the score requires. So um, for this particular project, I was sort of inspired in the fall semester, I taught a film scoring class. And as part of this class, I have guest artists come and give a, a one and a half hour typical, typically length talk to the students. And I had Alan Menken at one of these. Um, I had people who, uh, other composers who have Emmy Ward winning composers like Martin Erskine. I've had people who have won uh, Clio's, which are advertising grand, uh, Oscars. And I've had a friend named Jeff Rona, who's a very well-known Hollywood composer this fall. He's done two, but this fall he came and spoke to the crowd, to the, to the audience. And one of the things that he said was that when he starts a score, what he typically does is he opens up one session and he works in logic pro and he writes a series of music cues all on one session and in normal times he typically gets the director and the producers over to his space and they go through everything all in one session one cue to the next to the next and he takes notes and then i watched a, a video with um, junkie xl where he made in one of his tutorial videos he made a very long, like almost 15 or 20 minute symphonic suite for a film that he used to score. So what I thought I would do was take, be inspired by that. And this is, this will be three 30 minute TV shows, this mini series. So I thought that I would put together a mini suite that would capture the world, the music world that I would create for the show. Now, prior to doing that, I had a long conversation, probably an hour to an hour and a half with the filmmakers, and they were, it's a team. And what I 
spoke about with them was the story and what they hoped to convey. And we talked about some historical stuff. And I got a sense of the kinds of the kinds of um, moods, emotions, and that that the film would contain, and how it would sort of unfold, and like se- several relevant facts about things that happened afterwards, and how this was the sort of starting of a future, whole new way of things going on. I can't be too specific, so it's kind of hard to talk like that. But I will tell you it's about sports. And so the first thing I did was, in my mind, I put together, and let me switch here, a kind of a story, right? And I just very, very, that very, very uh, rough outline. I don't want to get too specific with this. I just want this to be outlines of emotions, moods, feelings, and things that I could realize. So I've got the intro, introduction of the music. I've got the main theme. I've got something I call beginnings, competition, loss and reflection, realization, never give up, and aftermath, and then the theme reprise. So basically, I write about a four and a half minute piece of music, and it's like a mini, it's a suite that would be like a mini version of one episode of the documentary with everything compressed. So in other words, the show is going to be 30 minutes. Each show is going to be 30 minutes long. And I'll, in four minutes or five minutes, I've squeezed 30 minutes worth of information into that. And the reason I thought to do this like this would be to give the filmmakers a sense of how all this music would fit together as opposed to just sending them random pieces of music, library music that I specifically write for their film. So they can see how the theme transforms into another bit into, into, you know, the beginnings, then how that moves into a competition because it is sports and there is competitiveness. And then, you know, sometimes you lose and you have reflection about that loss. And then you might realize what you have to do to get better and you don't give up. And then you finally win, which I don't put here, and then the aftermath of that, and then just to tie it all together, the reprise of the theme at the end. So this is sort of like a little story I put together, and let's see how I worked on this. All right, so now, this is the session. It's about four and a half minutes long, like I said. And what I did for this was I opened up a blank session and I instantiated about 30 or 40 instruments with contact preloaded, Omnisphere, and some other soft, uh, you know, virtual instruments that I use. And I just had them all hidden and deactivated, right? So you could see if we look down here in the tracks list over on the far left, and this is Pro Tools. I use Pro Tools to write in. I've got the remnants of stuff left over, right? So if I make those visible, they're all down at the bottom. So if I want to add an instrument, I I can just right-click on one of these, make it active, and go from there rather than having to call up another menu and put in another instrument. And it just saves time. And I can just hide it and make them inactive. It doesn't take up any CPU power. And it's it's just like a really quick way to work. So I really like that. yeah, if you've got any questions, I'm monitoring the chat for those of you that are out there, the few of you that are out there today. So as I was writing, in, in addition to creating a world of themes and melodic and rhythmic content, I also wanted to create the sound world that the score would live in. So as I'm writing, I'm adding instruments one at a time, and I'm sort of building up a palette here. And then as I'm writing, I'm also ordering things and color coding them. And so I can zoom in a little bit and show you some of this stuff. So all these, I guess that's kind of a purplish color tracks here. Let me zoom in a little bit. So it's easier for you that are watching on laptops can see. 
So you could see going from the top to the bottom, and this is all virtual. I did play a couple of um, I did play a couple of acoustic guitar tracks, which I'll get to in a minute. But starting from the top going down, I've got a nylon guitar sample in Omnisphere, then a Embira, which is a thumb piano, an African thumb piano, a mandolin swarm, which is about 15 or 20 mandolins playing in unison, celeste balls, these are synthesized sounds, glock, tubular bell, crotales, and then down into my percussion. So I've got suspended cymbals, which are mostly mallet rolls, and then using some bigger percussion like Zimmer, Hans Zimmer percussion from Spitfire, and then Heaviosity ethnic drums, Spitfire audio timpani, excuse me, I'm having scroll issues here. <laughs> and then a couple of drum sets. So I've got the uh, Spitfire bottom drums. I've got two instances of that, and then Easy Drummer, a couple of instances of that. And then I've got some basses. I've got like a synthesized bass, which is mini Moog sound and down at the bottom I also have an upright bass and then piano whoops yeah the scrolling thing Fender Rhodes Wurlitzer Celeste harp so these are all my keyboardish kinds of sounds right then I've got some synthesis synthesized sounds I've got this Sorry. Cool pads. Oh, and I've got something out of order, finger symbols. And then below that, I've got a bunch of vocal patches and then a bunch of different string patches. And on this particular thing, I'm using ensemble patches. I'm not using uh, individual sections. There's a whole thing about that, and maybe I'll do a video why I do that at some point in the future, but there's a, a lot of reasons why. I do have a solo violin and a solo cello, and then at the bottom, my acoustic bass. And then I've got all these, uh, I've got an instrument here, which I don't need to see. And then I've got a couple of tracks for my guitar, and then I've got a master track for my guitar. Oh, I've got two and more guitars. And then below that, I've got some effects, hall, plate reverb, altiverb, and let me zoom out again. So I've got all my effects there, and then I've got a music track where everything is routed to, and then a master track where I've got this Clarity M, which is my meters that I've got on a little unit here on my desktop. So... That's basically the template. And, you know, it, it sorry. Um, man, my scroll wheel is going crazy today. Hmm. It's not working correctly. All right. Let me, give me one second. All of a sudden, Pro Tools is being wacky. Great. So with that in mind, I'll play, let's, let me play through it and then I'll talk, it, talk you through it. So now you can also see that in the top here, I've got these memory locations or markers where I've got everything planned out. I put those in afterwards. I didn't, you know, or as I was writing, to be honest with you, I didn't pre-plan how long every section was going to be. So let me play this and then we'll talk about it on the other side.
All right, so that's a playthrough of the basic suite. So one thing I wanted to accomplish with this was to make sure that going through all the different sections that the transitions were really smooth and that all of these different sections would either flow into the next one or if they were a quick change that it would fit. In other words, it wasn't out of left field somewhere that even though this was an abrupt transition, you could hear that it worked with the previous section and with what comes afterwards. So that's something I wanted to keep in mind as I went through this. So let's take a look uh, a little bit more internally. So we start off and I can't get um, Pro Tools is acting funny, man. Right, let me make these larger. Uh, that's too large. Let's make it medium. All right. So start off here with some long sustained notes, right? Now, there's a lot of activity happening there, right? Which you don't typically associate with samples. So let's look. So these are, this is where uh, Spitfire Audio has really does a great job is that they create these string instruments that have motion to them. They're animated and they do things that you can't program. They do things that only a live player can do. And if I was r working with live players, which there's no budget or time in this project, it'll be virtual except for my acoustic guitar playing. I would notate this stuff, but to have this stuff here, it's a matter of learning how to make it fit in. And that's another concept to think about is that if you're a young composer and you're just starting out, I've been collecting samples and libraries and sounds and learning how to program for decades. You, you might have stuff that's, you know, you're just starting out. This is something that you have to build up over time. And um, what I would say to you is that you take the instruments that you've got and two things. Learn how to write what's idiomatic for the instruments and also write to the strengths of the sounds that you have. So if you don't have really good agitato strings, don't write agitato string parts. Write and find another solution. Find something else that will make that animate that kind of rhythm for you. And what I mean by writing idiomatically for the instrument is if you've got a woodwind playing, they have to take a breath, right? If you've got French horns playing, well, if you're above high C, that for a long period of time, that gets to be really... Thank you, Evan. Appreciate that. Um, if you're above high C, they don't really live up there. Learn where the singing part of each instrument lives. So... Let's get back to this. So right now I've got this patch here. This is air, ice, air, and trotto, right? So this is a particular articulation. And let's switch views. And I can control it with... And it's a beautiful, delicate piece of music, right? piece of sampling. It's really great. And you can write some beautiful stuff with that. And on top of that, I've got that layered with this female vocal sound from Omnisphere. Right, and those together, if I were to play them together. So you get it balanced so that you can hear both sounds and they become an aggregate stacked sound. And then after that plays for a little while, I bring in another one of these Spitfire sounds, and this is called Ricochet, and these are just uh, these minor. I'm in E minor, I think, right? Oh no, I'm, I'm in, yeah. 
I think I'm in G. I can't remember what piece or what key I'm in with this. All right, so you layer all that together. And then the strings come in. And that creates an atmosphere and a mood, right? So, you know, let's say we're starting off when, if this is a autobiographical bit, it's about a person and they're a child, right? The wonder, the wonder of childhood, you know, everything is new, it's fresh, right? You want to just sort of imagine how do you create that with music? So then these guys come in the strings and then I bring in another sound, right? A little bit of animation here. So what I do here is something that I really like. So I've got this nylon guitar sample, which I played in. And it's got, and it's panned a little bit to the left. And then I write an interlocking complementary rhythm with the, with the mbira. So it's playing the same rhythm actually, and then now it changes here a little bit. And then on top of that, I've got this nice rush of sound here with the mandolin swarm right here, and then these celeste balls come in. Right, a nice wash of sound. And I'm using a Lydian uh, scale on that. And then these crotales interlock with the chel ch celeste balls. And notice that, I mean, this is simple stuff, right? The celeste balls are going down, descending, and the crotales are ascending. So this whole thing is a really nice aggregate. It's a nice, a really nice wash. Okay, so I introduced the Lydian there in the um, in the mandolin swarm because when the piano melody comes in right here let's see if we can get some notation up for that Give it a second. Pro Tools takes forever. Here we go. Right, so it's almost like a, a lullaby, a very innocent, a very childlike, but not childish uh, little theme there. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about is give me one second to just have a beverage. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> when writing film music, one thing that I find uh, very helpful, and it's something that I sort of impress upon my students is to write um, motivic composing, to compose using short motives that are easily recognizable. So right here I've got this little two measure phrase, right? Right over a G. And then the left hand figures, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Right, and that's very recognizable. It creates a kind of mood, and it, it, I think it works really well with this, with this uh, opening here. So let's listen to the aggregate of that. Now, another thing to talk about is orchestration. To get motion, you, what I like to do with my orchestrations is to continually unfold. It's like things move. They don't stay static with just the same group of instruments. It's like you're passing the peas around at dinner or something like that. 
And so we start off here with this. It is a very simple piano theme. Right? And that twice through. And then the third time, double with celeste. And then I balance it so that the celeste is like a warm blanket, a warm glowing blanket being wrapped around the piano. You know? That's a sound that or a piano being doubled by a Fender Rhodes sound is very dear to me. And I started getting that sound in my ear when I was in my 20s and I was playing keyboards at the original off-Broadway production of Little Shop of Horrors. The band was a pianist, conductor, a drummer, and the drummer played bells as well, and a bass player and a keyboard player, which I started out as uh, subbing on the keyboard chair and then I took that over. And quite a bit of the show had duets between the Fender Rhodes and the acoustic piano. And then the drummer would play bells, uh, orchestra bells as well. And that sound sort of really got in my ears and I really liked it. And I, I try to use it as often as possible within taste, of course, you know. And so this all sits on top of that rhythmic pulse. And then now I'm gonna change keys just to lift things up a little bit. And again, I change keys and notice that the pulse stops here, right when I change keys. So again, changing orchestrations, it's, it's like a new chapter or a new paragraph. And I bring in a solo cello and the acoustic bass comes in right here. change key again right and so now we, we've arrived we've moved to a different key from what that we started out in I believe we're in E major now and I've got this very so beginnings right so now you're maybe in your you're seven or eight years old and you're getting interested in the sport that you're going to become really great at and you know, you're, you're, it's wondrous to you, and you know, it's just, it's just more growing forward. So I've got these guitars. And they fit in with the piano. There's actually too much reverb on those. Let me turn that down a little bit. Right, and so that comes in like that. And the piano obviously is um, working here, and, and instead of doubling with the celeste, I do switch here to double the piano with the Rhodes, Fender Rhodes piano. And if you're wearing earbuds right now, it should be panning back and forth. And that's kind of a... You know, it's almost got an Alberti bass feel to it, right? With that, right? With that inner voice moving. Again, it's got a simple motive that you can re remember, and then to spice that up a little bit, I have these vocal phrases that I place in there, and I tune them up to this key. And then right here in this next section, I just wanted to stop and let things rest a little bit. So I've got this little figure with a little space between it, right? Just E to F sharp minor. E to G sharp minor, right? And I introduced some of these spacey uh, synth pads there.
and it's cool. They've got those sort of notes that happen after the fact. So if I play, you hear the da da do da da, almost like an arpeggio, and you can control the timbre on this. It's programmed it's at the mod wheel. So I I play that stuff in, and what I typically do is I play the part in. And then I use this thing called MIDI Merge, which in Pro Tools is right here. And then I can overdub these uh, CC controllers without losing the data of the notes that I've played. Okay, so now at this point, we're moving forward, right? I want to I want to start having things move faster so the chords move at a faster harmonic rate, rhythm, and we're leading into the next section, right? So, and also everything's been in 6-8 so far. And now we're on a five chord. B, a B suspended chord. Ah, oh, my marker's in the wrong spot. It should be over here. <laughs> All right, so we're into competition now, right? The big drama, agony of uh, defeat, the ecstasy of victory. What was that thing from the wild world of sports in the 1960s? So um, to lead us in there, I use these string evos, which are these evolving patches. And if I were just to play... There we go. You can hear how they have a lot of motion to them. And I just use that, these controls here to draw in a crescendo afterwards. All right, let's go. And again, these are things that I couldn't really play in. So it's really nice to have them and sprinkle them in to give some animation to the music and some life to what you're doing. So, and then there's a, a three, let's see, it's nine, eight, I believe, right there, right? Two, two, three, three, two, three, boom. Right, so it's, it's nine, eight measure of um, these big, this big descending scale and the strings. So I'm using these low strings. And now we're in to E minor. And as this, piece, as this section goes on, I'm just building up the layers of percussion and instruments. So I've got this low brass, which I find humorous, but it's, it's effective. So you can see this is like growing and growing as the, the section is unfolding, right? Getting more and more intense. But let's take a look at some of the drum programming. So let's solo some of these drums. I think that's all of them. So let's start here. So starting off simply with just a foot high hat, Adding some ethnic drums in the mid mid. So, what you want to do is. Oh, thank you. Is that I can't read that, Mr. The person that wrote finally caught up to hear the music. Competition se section is dope. Thanks. <laughs> um. So. What I would say is. Like the heavy, low-pitched drums, they should be in there for accents, and the mid-range drums should, and the hi-hats and shakers and stuff. Right, you can see how I build that up. One, two, 
One, two, three, two, two, three. And just keep layering the percussion as we get further and further into this. So let's listen to how that fits in with the competition section. Okay, so we're in this loss reflection section, and I'm going to have something to say about the piano later on, but um, I'm, again, I'm just doing a simple, all these piano figures are really simple, and that piano figure there is kind of a, a variation on the, um, uh, no, I don't want to do that, is kind of a variation on that opening figure. So if I were to just open this up and... Let's go back to the notation. So that opening figure on the piano is, right? And then here I've got, right, I've still got that half step. So that's sort of a variation on that, but we're not in Lydian anymore, although, you know, um, we're, we're using sort of a minor key. And, and the chords are, even though it's minor and reflective, the chords are ascending, right? So it does, it's not completely hopeless. And then I've got this choir pad, you know, giving a nice fullness in the background. So one thing I want to show is the way that I've layered my guitars in here. So they're really simple, just strumming chords. And that's in contrast during the competition section. You probably couldn't hear this, but you would hear it if it wasn't there. Uh, the acoustic guitars would do it. Dig it. Dig it. And I like another concept that I like to teach my students is to phrase into the downbeat so that you're giving the music some motion, right? So if we listen to the bass here, right here, bum, 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 right into the end of the phrase, into the beginning of the next phrase. So that's really a really cool technique, I think. And now really reflective here. Again, using the celeste and piano combination and transition. Got these really spacey pads, synth pads, and I'm doing sort of like a, a mandolin tremolo on the guitar on a B suspended chord. Now, one thing is that um, this film takes place you know, the actual thing that they're covering takes, yes, there's a lot of delay on the guitar. Um, it takes place in the 1990s. So this next section sort of has 
a little bit of a 1990s rhythm feel to it. I wanted to get that in there, you know, energetic, uplifting, pop, a little bit of pop music feel to it. So let's take a look at what I'm doing with this drum loop here. Um, so this was programmed in Stylus and then I just rendered it as audio. And what I've done is I've inserted this filter here. And you can see that I've automated the filter. So it starts off really murky, getting rid of a lot, all the high end and just bringing it in. And you can see it moving right here. <laughs> all right, so now, this is very simple, right? It's just a, it's a very simple chord progression. Let's just uh, solo the guitar so you can hear that. With the synthesizer bass. Now, one thing with guitars is I'm playing it in a way, like if I were to just take this guitar here, which I just so happen to have, and the chords, the way I'm fingering them is, you know, it's... Right, those are the basic chords. But when I'm playing it, I'm leaving... I'm leaving the B and the E string to ring so that you get sort of like... Right? You get those ringing strings, which really add a nice color to the, to the guitar part. They're like a pedal point all the way through. And the way I build this up is I've got a Fender Rhodes and a Wurlitzer electric piano. playing very simply. Right, so they're layered together very simply because I don't, when the guitar is doing all that rhythm, the keyboards don't need to be doing all that rhythm. They need to be filling out the sound and just an occasional little rhythmic pulse here and there. And I've got the map, just a very simple motivic melody in the piano. And then just gradually building and building and layering things in, you know, in other words, those uh, I've got string pad in here on the chamber strings, very simple. Just again, filling the sound out and then as it unfolds, I start bringing these things in. There was that song, um, forget who did it, but they sampled a Rolling Stones song and it was a big hit uh, in the 1990s. I sort of had that, this doesn't sound anything like it, but the concept of having those high, high spiky strings just driving in a rhythm like that, sort of uh, that concept came here, even though the music doesn't sound anything like the 
that one particular song, which I can't remember the name of it now. So this unfolds, and then we leads up to this rhythmic. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Andrew. So it leads up to this these rhythmic hits here. So I have those rhythmic hits happening, and I fade out the audio on all of those. And while that's happening, a variation on the original piano melody starts fading in, right? Well, it's very similar. And then we're just leading to the end. And bring in a little Lydian feel, just to tie everything together. And also up, upbeat, positive ending, because this film ends, it's a feel good overall, the three episodes. So I did this and I rendered it uh, uh, an MP3 and I sent it off to the filmmakers with a little note telling them what I had done, even though I uh, and explained it to them. And then the next day we had a, about another hour conversation. So, you know, the upshot was that they really liked the music. They really liked this, which probably means that when I work for them in the future, if I'm fortunate enough to, I'll be doing more of these suites because it gives them a sense of how they're going to put the story together. And it actually helps them out as well. They did have some comments, though, which now that I'm working on this, the actual music, I'm taking those into account. So they wanted there to be some more edgy sections. And they liked the piano a lot, but they wanted to make sure that it wasn't overwhelming the actual music that they're going to be using in the film. So I, as I'm working, I'm making adjustments as I'm now writing the score, the, the pieces that they're going to use for the score. So let's talk about the next steps, all right? So the next steps were for me to save this session. And I can show, to save this session as a notation version, right? And then open up the score editor in Pro Tools which don't get me started on how they own Sibelius and they give us this garbage. Um, anyway, and just go through and make the score look as good as I can in Pro Tools by quantizing things. And I'm not touching the original track. This, is, you know, this stayed the same. Uh, quantizing durations, making sure that everything looks as, as, as good as it can here in Pro Tools. And then there's a send to Sibelius command and you, so what I do is I, I take the session and I mute all, uh, I deactivate all the plugins and I send it over to my laptop and I open it up in my laptop and then I, cause I have Sibelius in my laptop and then I clean the score up and then I just make a very, very, very rough score. I don't worry about the correct spelling and harmonics or any of that. And just something that I can use to refer that has all, all the music in it, right? I mean, look right here, that's not really accurate. You know, I've got these dyads playing in a few spots when that's just a sweep of notes, but I know basically what that is. So when I want to recreate that, I don't have to worry about playing the exact notes. I just need to know the gesture. And I can see all the different parts here very easily. I can see the piano melody, right? What the other strings are doing. And I can just go through the entire score And I've got a big score here, right? With everything in it, all the instruments. Uh, some of, just like the drum loop tracks not in here, obviously. So I get this together. And then what I can do then is I can extract little sections and make just the piano figure 
for the theme or just the theme or just a couple of like a couple of things here and there I can go back to this or if I don't want to look at this entire score I can just open up this small on my iPad uh, with just a couple of lines in it and you refer back to that and as I'm writing take the material and the ideas that I've got here and start to develop them transform them stretch them out into longer bits and make music that will make sense for this narrative that's going to be created. So that's very helpful. And then I'll play everything back in. I won't take what I've done here and and rec and just import the MIDI. I'll play everything back in because I want it to be unique for each one. So, uh, okay. So now the next thing to do is to create a proper template for the film. And what I do at that point is... I select all these tracks that are in here, right? And then what I'll do is save a copy in. And then I make sure that none of these things are selected, right? Because I don't want audio files. I don't want the main playlist. I don't, I, well, just selected tracks only. I just want there to be the, the instruments, the color coding, um, the, the, the arrangement of the instruments up and down the score. And let me close this. And then what will happen is I'll work on that for a while and I'll create a template and save it here in Pro Tools. And then I can just open that up and I'll save it on my desktop for right now. I would name it the big... Um, Whatever, whatever the name of the song is, I would name it with my naming conventions. And then this would open up, right? And I can start with this. This will take a, like a minute to open up. There's a lot of data to open. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Appreciate that last comment, if you're still here. All right, so let me show you like my finalized template. You can see that it's similar. So I've zoomed in a little bit. So you can see that it's similar in terms of the instruments used, but I've got other things going on here. So for example, I've got VCA tracks so that I can solo different sections. Thank you, Opus. Right? <clears throat> so, and I also created a bunch of groups here, which is really helpful. And I've separated out all my sections with a VCA so that I can just solo this, and it will solo that section. I don't have to play around with soloing individual instruments. And all the way down. And then let me get down to the bottom here. Oh, and the other thing I do, too, is... I make sure that I purge all my samples in contact so that when I load contact in, it's loaded with as minimal uh, of CPU footprint and um, also, right? So I've got 50 instrument tracks for the score and I'm only using 14% of the memory. Very, very small CPU usage, 9% up here. And then as... I'm playing notes in, contact loads those samples in. It works out really well. And then I, I've got some acoustic guitar tracks pre-set up. And then what I've got here with all these tracks that, are in, that have this eye, this lime eye turned on, that's the track input monitor. These are all audio tracks. And I will monitor all the instrument tracks and mix them down into stems. And these are all the stems for this score so that when I'm done with the cue and I want to render stems for mixing, I just have to record enable these tracks here and hit the play button, hit the record button and it makes the stems, everything's pre-routed. And I also have a lot of different re uh, effects, time-based effects here and they're 
notice that I've got short strings hall and long hall. So for the short strings, short articulations, I have one kind of a hall which has a, a shorter, de uh, shorter decay and the long hall has a longer decay. And then I've got a solo hall for like the solo violin and the solo cello. I've got a plate for the drums. I've got a plate for the key verb, for the keyboards. I've got a separate reverb for the piano and separate reverb for the guitars. And then I've got a bunch of delays and chorus and panning. And what happens if, is if I use, let's say that I'm going to play this nylon string guitar, right? Sampled. I, I don't want to, I have a nylon string guitar, but I like the way this sounds. And if I'm going to play a passage on this, and I want to get some of that delay in, I would just simply bus it out to that. Oops, and turn up the the send. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. There's more to come. <laughs> now, I've got this here, right? So what I do when I want to make stems is I'll go down to the dotted digital delay and what I'll do is I'll send a copy of that audio. I'll bust that to the high pulsers, which is where the, 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 those that nylon string guitar and I just have to make it to zero, right? And then that will get recorded in with these stems. So it's very it's very easy to work this way. And then I can just, you know, start writing the score. Now, the one other thing I wanted to say about this is as I'm writing music, I'm going to want to have more sounds and more colors in there. And it's very easy to add, uh, to add different, more sounds if you want. So, for example, let's say I wanted to add, um, so I've got stylus here, right? So what if I wanted to add a, another couple of instant, another instance of st st stylus? Well, I've got this grouped to the drum group, and I've also got it routed to the drum kits and loops bus, right? So instead of Command Shift N and making a new stereo instrument track and importing that and then clicking on stylus, all I have to do is right click on this and duplicate, right? And I just s select what I want to duplicate. I won't duplicate the playlists, but I will the insert, right? And then it quickly makes it. It's all routed. It's all color-coded and everything. And I would just go drum loops two, and it's done. So I can keep on adding colors as I go on very quickly. One thing is that you see a lot of, you see a lot of film composers that are re very successful have templates with like a thousand tracks. Well, I don't want to navigate through a thousand tracks and having things in folders is great. But I want to keep everything as simple as possible. And you know, 70, 80 tracks, that's e fairly easy to navigate. Once you start getting above that, it becomes really difficult to navigate and know where everything is. And um, I, don't, I just want to create a particular sound for each score that I work on. I don't want to have you know 1,500 tracks open with every sound I own available to me instantly. I, it's not so difficult to do what I'm doing here. And the benefits I save, the time benefits from not having to scroll up and down a thousand tracks or however else you have to do it, for me, it works well this way. So anyway, I think that we're going to call it here. It's been about an hour. I appreciate everybody that's been watching. I've got eight or nine people and hopefully over the next couple of weeks, more and more people will watch this. And as I keep doing this every week, I'll get more and more people to come hopefully. But if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, hit the like button. If this is afterwards, please leave any comments. I do answer the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've learned something. I hope this has been enjoyable. Uh, I have to make sure that I'm not so parched when I'm talking so I don't cough. But I thought it went fairly well for the first one of these. Anyway, thanks so much. I've been Pete Calandra, and I'll catch you on the next one.